Once around Beta Lyra. Beta Lyra, or Shellac as it's called, is the second brightest star in the, the very small constellation of Lyra, the Greek harp. But it's really quite a faint star. The bright star Vega is the lead star for the constellation, but the rest of them are really, really quite modest. And so Beta only comes in at magnitude 3.5 making it a lot fainter. And it's one corner of the parallelogram that marks out the body of this constellation. You can see the four stars all roughly equal in brightness there. And in fact, Beta makes an excellent guide star to go star hopping across the bottom of the parallelogram and find the ring nebula M57, which is marked on the star map there. Now, in terms of distance, the Hipparchos satellite came out with a figure of 960 light years. So this is a lot further away than its brighter neighbor, Vega, which is only, I think, 27 light years away, accounting for perhaps it being seen as relatively faint. But when we look at it with a telescope, and we've got a lovely image on the right, and a close up here showing that it is a triple star system. In fact, there are multiple stars shown in the image there, and we'll come on to each of them. But the primary star, the bright one that you can see there, is actually an eclipsing binary pair. So this is Beta Lyra A, and it's Beta Lyra AA, and the binary pair of those is AA1 and AA2. So this is getting complicated. The star AB was also detected in 2006, just half an arc second away. So this is a hierarchical triple. We have AB, and then we have AA1 and AA2. AA1 and AA2 are so close together, you can't see them as separate. They make up the bright dot in the center of the image, and AA, uh, sorry, AB is just lower and left of it. So when we look at the AA star, you get a fantastic light curve showing how the brightness changes over time in a 12.9 day cycle. So we have brightenings and dimmings and you get alternating amounts of dimming. And this is characteristic of an eclipsing binary. So you have the two stars orbiting around each other and they have different brightnesses. So when you can see both of them, you get the full brightness of the object. But when the bright star goes behind the dim star, the brightness takes a large drop as it's eclipsed. And half an orbit later, the dimmer star goes behind the bright one and you lose the light from that instead. So the light drops to a lesser degree. And this, of course, implies that the orbital plane of the two stars around each other matches the line of sight from the Earth. And the data on the right-hand side here shows that very, very clearly. But it also shows something else, and that is that the light never stands still. It takes these curved dips, but even when it's at its maximum, it's not flat. It rises and falls all the time. And that isn't usual for an eclipsing binary. Often the uh, periods between the eclipses are relatively stable. So that's uh, worth some further attention. And what it's really telling us is that this is an incredibly close binary. I love this image, which is showing that you just can't see anything. Uh, the two of them are so close together that they're within the central bright area right into the middle of the image there. We just can't split them apart with a telescope like this. So we have a simulation of what we think is going on here, which is the two stars orbiting round, creating these line of sight eclipses as they do so. But because they are so close together, there is a distortion of the uh, primary star, the brighter of the two, with a lobe pulled towards its companion by gravity. And we think that there is an accumulation of matter around the secondary star 
a torus, a ring around the center, an accretion disk of matter that has been transferred from the primary to the secondary. So the primary reached the end of its life, swelled up into a giant, lost control of its outer layers, and about um, over a period we've lost a lot of material from the primary, boosting the mass of the secondary. And we think that about um, one ten thousandth of a solar mass is transferring across every year. So one solar mass in 50,000 years. And this is changing the orbital period of the system. It's gradually increasing by about 19 seconds each year, something that we can actually measure. But that accretion disk, the torus around the secondary, is blocking our view of it, making it really quite difficult to understand exactly the characteristics. Now, I said we couldn't image it directly with a single telescope, but we have been able to combine several telescopes. The Chara Array at Georgia State University consists of a series of telescopes and they are able to take the light from each of the small mirrors and combine them into one central location and create an interferometer using this aperture synthesis originally developed in uh, Cambridge for radio telescopes by Martin Ryle and then followed up with the Coast project also in a bunker at the radio observatory here in Cambridge. Um, it's a lovely mad scientist underground laboratory with beams of light and lasers and uh, lots of moving mirrors that brings the light together, brings it back into phase, given the distribution of the separate mirrors, and gives you the effect of one large mirror. So that we have with the coast, I think it goes at a maximum of around 100 meters, but Chara built on a larger scale and with more mirrors can create the effect of a 330 meter diameter mirror, giving you tremendous resolution down to um, about a milli arc second. And with that, we have created the best thing in terms of imaging this star beta Lyra. The Chara data is on the left. So it's not a true image, it's an interferometer picture, but it's as close as you really want. Um, and there's a little model on the right showing what we think that is representing in terms of the black primary and the obscuring torus of matter around the secondary there. And from that, we've been able to compute a very good orbital position and uh, uh, the orbital period of just over 12.8 days and indeed work out the mass of the objects. So the primary, the donor star, around about 12.8 solar masses, and the secondary that's gaining mass, 2.8. So quite a big difference between them. And the data has been accumulated and turned into a lovely animation of these two whizzing around each other, highly sped up, of course. Takes uh, 12 days to go round, but... Uh, you can see the two, and you can almost imagine this showing the matter being transferred from one to the other. So that's the AA1 and AA2 interacting binary. And they're described in as semi-detached because essentially the envelope of one is in contact with the envelope of the other. They're so close together. Now, there are additional components that I said I'd mention, and they are given the letters uh, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And the A, B, and F members do seem to be physically associated. And the Gaia spacecraft has identified them as part of a co-moving group, Gaia 8, with about 100 other members moving ac across the uh, galaxy, moving around, in an orbit that suggests that they were all formed together around about 30 to 100 million years ago in a cluster together. Um, and so we have some statistics on these. We know that uh, the B star is uh, 
a fairly massive uh, B7V, so main sequence star of class B7, and uh, about 80 times the power output of our sun. The F star, well, that's a little cooler. It's an A-class star, although Gaia lists this as uh, G. So th this is quite curious that we have two different classifications for this, something which I want to look into further. Um, so so uh, it's classed as A, it's classed as G, and it's classed as AM in another paper. And the M just stands for peculiarity of its metal composition. So they're agreeing with the A category. Um, and it seems likely that this cluster formed around 30 to 100 million years ago, because so far, none of the stars that have been observed in this Gaia 8 co-moving group are giant branch stars. So they're all not yet evolved into that phase of their existence, which suggests that they can't be particularly old because some of them are fairly massive and uh, would perhaps after 100 million years t turn off onto the giant branch. Now, the other stars, C, D and E, sadly, they turned out to be just ordinary line of sight effects and at different distances uh, between three times closer and three times further away than the rest. So although the stars that you can see, A, B, C, D, E, and F, look like they're part of a multiple system, they're not, only half of them are, but Gaia has shown us that there are a hundred others and revealed this cluster origin. So fascinating system. So that's uh, one trip around Beta Lyra, and it's often a target for our public observing evenings here at the University of Cambridge when we turn our telescopes armed with cameras onto this and reveal some of these very interesting stars. Thanks very much for listening.